Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel, Investo Time. Today, we're diving into an exciting forecast from gold expert Adrian Day. If you're a gold investor or just curious about where gold prices are headed, you won't want to miss this. Let's get into it. I, I think what's going to happen in the near term is we're going to get in the West, led by the US, but also in Canada and in, in Europe, we're going to see interest rates come down. We've seen it in Canada a couple of times, of course. We've seen it in, in Europe. And we're just waiting for the Federal Reserve to cut rates. And typically, when the Fed cuts rates, gold always moves up from there. Um, we'll see a slowing economy, and a slowing economy is actually positive for gold, not because of a direct correlation between a, a slowing economy and gold, but because w when the economy slows, investors look ahead and say, ah, that means more easing on the part of the Federal Reserve, which is positive for gold. The gold market has finally received the long-awaited signal since mid-2022 with the Federal Reserve hinting at potential interest rate cuts as early as September. This development has driven gold prices to unprecedented heights, with the metal surpassing $2,500 per ounce for the first time ever. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell recently indicated that a rate cut could be considered at the next meeting, signaling a major shift in monetary policy. This change, along with rising geopolitical tensions and signs of a weakening U.S. economy, has significantly boosted gold's value. Adrian Day, founder and president of Adrian Day Asset Management, offers insights into the factors behind gold's stellar performance. He points out that central bank purchases, particularly by China, are driving gold's rise as countries seek to diversify their reserves and guard against the weaponization of the US dollar. Additionally, Chinese investors are turning to gold due to concerns about their domestic banking system and limited investment alternatives. Day anticipates that interest rate cuts in the US, Canada, and Europe will further support gold prices. While an economic slowdown is not ideal, it could increase investor interest in gold as a safe haven asset. The recent decline in momentum in the US labor market, as seen in July's data, has also contributed to gold's ascent. However, the surge in gold prices has had some consequences. A recent Goldman Sachs report notes that while the price increase impacts cyclical Chinese consumption, the heightened demand driven by economic uncertainty and lower interest rates has generally offset the negative effects of reduced incomes. Before we dive into clips from Adrian Day's interview, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the video. You know, we know why gold is rising at the moment. So I'll answer the question from I'll answer the question, but from a different point of view, if I may. We know why gold is going up at the moment. Gold is going up number one because of the central bank buying, um, led by China, not the last two months, but led by China. But many, many central banks are buying are buying gold and they're buying it to diversify their reserves and specifically to try to isolate their reserves from the weaponization of the dollar. So, you know, the weaponization of the dollar, in my view, is not a good thing, but it's not like a global catastrophe in the sense that you're asking your question, I don't think. That's been the primary driver of gold over the last 18 months. Maybe a third of all gold buying has come from uh, central banks. You've got Chinese buying, Chinese investment, investors, not central banks now, but Chinese investors, the Chinese consumers are buying gold because they're concerned about the fragility of their own banking system. And, you know, they don't have a lot of other places where they want to or can put their money as a security, as a safety. You know, the um, uh, you don't buy real estate if you're Chinese right now. The stock market has, has gone down for the last 18 months. Doesn't look like a safe place to put your money. They're not allowed to buy crypto so gold is is a safe place so 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 both of both of those factors those are the two major drivers of gold over the last 18 months and and including into this year and and they're not they're not reflections of of catastrophe on the global scale so i i think what's going to happen in the near term is we're going to get in the west led by the u.s but also in Canada and in, in Europe, we're going to see interest rates come down. We've seen it in Canada a couple of times, of course. We've seen it in, in Europe. And we're just waiting for the Federal Reserve to cut rates. And typically, when the Fed cuts rates, 
gold always moves up f from there. We'll see a slowing economy, and a slowing economy is actually positive for gold because w when the economy slows, investors look ahead and say, ah, that means more easing on the part of the Federal Reserve, which is positive for gold. So the things I'm talking about, a slowing economy, is, is not a particularly positive environment, but, um, but I think, I, you know, again, it's not a global catastrophe if we have a slowing economy and, and, and cutting interest rates. And, and that's what's going to spur gold. In a startling display of fiscal expansion, the United States national debt has skyrocketed at an unprecedented rate, leaving economists and policymakers grappling with its long-term implications. Just a few years ago in the summer of 2017, the prospect of a 20 trillion federal debt seemed daunting fast forward to today, and that figure has not only been surpassed, but has ballooned by an additional 75%. The current federal debt is a staggering $35 trillion, increasing at a mind-boggling rate of $330 million per hour. This translates to $7.9 billion per day, and an annual increase of $2.8 trillion. Even more alarming is the projection that the national debt will exceed $40 trillion within the next three years, effectively doubling since 2017. The government's traditional approach of printing more money to address this issue is fraught with limitations major buyers of U.S. debt. Notably, China and Russia have been reducing their holdings or outright selling their positions this shift in the debt market. Could potentially lead to significant challenges in selling U.S. debt in the future, further complicating the country's fiscal strategy, let's get back to the interview. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying, I wish I could remember who said it, but there's an old saying there's an awful lot of ruin in a country, meaning that, you know, it can take a long time for a country on the wrong paths with the wrong economic policies. It can take a long time for that to lead to, you know, economic ruin. And the larger the country, the wealthier the country, the longer it takes. And particularly if, if you were, in the case of the US, if you were the world's reserve currency, where basically you could print as much money as you wanted, knowing that other people around the world would have to buy it. But any wealthy country can build up, uh, you know, a wealth of infrastructure, a wealth of, of savings. Uh, and so wrong economic policies just take a long, long time uh, to, to lead to economic ruin. But we're getting to the point in the U.S., I, I think, if you look at the lower 50 percent, and I'm focusing on the U.S. because obviously it's the largest economy, but it's also where I am. You know, the lower 50 percent of the population in terms of income and in terms of assets are really beginning to struggle on a truly fundamental basis. You know, the majority of people in the U.S. do not, could not put their hands on $3,000 for an emergency. I would say probably 30 to 40 percent of people in the U.S. are living paycheck to paycheck. So when the paycheck comes in, they have to decide, what do we spend it on? The paycheck's gone, there's nothing left. I think we're getting to a point where that's really going to spill over into some very, very hard economic times for people. Um, you know, you've seen over the last 18 months, consumer spending has continued to go up in the US, and that's an aggregate, of course. So there's wealthy spending, there's poor people spending. But interestingly, consumer spending has gone up at a lower rate than inflation. So what that means is people are not continuing to buy the same amount of goods and services that they were. They're already cutting back because of inflation. But more significantly is that you've seen the savings rate after COVID, after the COVID lockdowns, when savings went up, you've seen the savings rate come back to pre-COVID levels, in fact, come back to like 10-year lows. And you've seen credit card debt explode upwards in the US. So what this means when you think about it from a personal point of view, it means a person that was buying stuff for his family two years ago is continuing to buy most of those things for his family, but is not out of income, but out of debt. And that simply cannot go on forever, especially when the credit card companies are charging people, you know, as much as 30 and 32% interest on their credit card balances. You know, that simply cannot go on much longer. Now, yes, the government can just, you know, print more money and, 
you know, just distribute more money to people. But that leads to problems at the extreme. That leads to problems, you know, in trying to sell your debt. We're seeing the groups that were the major buyers of U.S. debt are either no longer buying or are actually selling. Well, Russia obviously is out, you know, unique reasons. But China is also selling down their U.S. debt reasonably aggressively. I mean, we could say 10 years ago that they were continuing to buy, but at a lower rate than they pace than they were in the past. But now they're actually net sellers. As the national debt continues to increase at an alarming rate, questions are emerging about the sustainability of current economic policies and their long-term impact on future generations. This situation urgently calls for a thorough re-evaluation of fiscal policies and a concerted effort to address the growing financial burden before it becomes irreversible. If this video resonates with you, please share your perspective in the comments. Join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications by clicking the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.